five years, I've showed you this before, in 1979 to finally break through. And gold was making new highs, new nominal highs, and new real highs, but silver was not, and silver bugs were all disappointed, and they're like, what the hell is going on? What happened to this parabolic spike? I want that to continue. But it didn't until 1979, and then 1979 happened, and everything went crazy. And finally, what do we have here? The same thing. 2020 to 2024, I do see it, the same thing is happening. Four years of absolutely nothing. A top at 30, a double top at 30, and uh, we have not reached a new high. We have not reached 30 again. While gold is making new highs, this is the same thing that has happened twice before, 1968, 1974, and now. In a recent analysis, Rafi Farber from the Endgame Investor sheds light on historical monetary panics, notably those in 1968 and 1980 which propelled the gold to silver ratio to approximately 15 to 1. This surge suggests a widespread perception of silver experiencing full remonetization during those periods. The gold price set by President Roosevelt at $35 an ounce in 1934 triggered a rise in the gold to silver ratio, peaking at 98 to 1 in 1939. Following World War II, the ratio declined but surged again in the 1980s, hitting 97.5 to 1 in 1991 as silver prices plummeted to under $4 an ounce. Throughout the 20th century, the average gold-silver ratio stood at 47 to 1, while in the 21st century, it has ranged chiefly between 50 to 1 and 70 to 1, with peaks at 104.98 to 1 in 2020 and lows at 35 to 1 in 2011. Farber notes that silver typically lags behind gold during bull markets, even amid economic turbulence like the inflationary spike 1973. This disparity often leaves silver investors disillusioned as silver struggles to reach new highs for extended periods. While silver exhibits greater volatility, its long-term correlation with gold is evident. Notably, silver tends to outperform gold during gold bull markets. Despite gold's recent ascent to new heights, silver remains below its 2020 peak by about $5 per ounce and significantly below its all-time high of $30. Drawing parallels to historical market cycles, Farber suggests that silver has yet to surpass its previous peak, despite gold's record-breaking performance. Recent reports from CNBC echo this sentiment, anticipating silver to potentially steal the spotlight shortly. Join us as we delve into insights shared by Rafi Farber. To stay updated with our latest uploads, subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you. The gold to silver ratio in 1970s, 1968 to 1980. 1968 was a monetary panic. It was essentially the collapse of the London gold pool. So that was a monetary panic. And we see that whenever there is a monetary panic, where do we get to? 15 to 1. Three times 1919, the end of World War I, that was also a monetary panic. Uh, 1968 was a monetary panic, and 1980 was a monetary panic. Each time during those panics, 15 to 1, what does that mean? That silver is fully remonetized by the market, not by statute, not by central banks, but by the public. So we saw in 1968 was gold was going higher and higher and higher. Nixon just closed the gold window over here. And what was the response of silver when Nixon closed the gold window? It just kept falling relative to gold, and silver bugs were like, what's going on? He closed the gold window. Why is silver so weak? Uh, and so we see 1970, 1968 to 1970, the gold to silver ratio was climbing. And even after the gold window closed, it started climbing again, meaning silver was weakened relative to gold up to about 42, 43, maybe 44 uh, to a high there. And then it started to fall only in the last five years from about 1975 to 1980 did silver finally catch up. And when it did, it caught up like crazy and went to an all-time high of 50, which is about $300 or something in today's dollars, but who knows where it's going to go. My point is that this has happened before. Silver has lagged gold during periods of bull market movement, and I'll show you more of this in the slides ahead. What tends to happen is that silver does nothing for about five years until it makes a parabolic spike. We see here the uh, the chart from 1968 to 1973. And you should remember, even if you weren't alive, that 1973 was a year of inflationary major panic. If you look at the CPI charts going back to 1973, especially, that was the oil embargo. That was the breakout, the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, uh, which created an inflationary spike over all the world because OPEC was embargoing uh, oil. Even in 1973, with that inflationary panic, 
silver was only able to meet its previous high of 1968. So silver bugs, of course, were like, what the hell is going on? Silver sucks. It's manipulated. It's not a money. It's horrible, etc., etc. Five years of absolutely nothing, 1968 to 1973. And only then did we have a parabolic spike in 1974 to $6.50. $6 the same thing happened from 1974. Remember that spike back here? Well, that spike was this tiny little thing in 1974. From that spike to $6.5, it took another five years. I've showed you this before in 1979 to finally break through. And gold was making new highs, new nominal highs, and new real highs, but silver was not. And silver bugs were all disappointed. And they're like, what the hell is going on? What happened to this parabolic spike? I want that to continue. But it didn't until 1979. And then 1979 happened and everything went crazy. And finally, what do we have here? The same thing. 2020 to 2024. I can't show you the rest of this chart because it doesn't exist yet, not in this temporal universe. And I'm not a Navi, I'm not a prophet, so I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen. But I do see that the same thing is happening again. Four years of absolutely nothing. A top at 30, a double top at 30. And uh, we have not reached a new high. We have not reached 30 again. While gold is making new highs, this is the same thing that has happened twice before, 1968, 1974. And now, in a comprehensive analysis, Farber delves into Argentina's central bank strategy of offsetting printed money through interest payments on reserves, cautioning that such interest ultimately seeps into the economy, fueling inflation. Drawing parallels, Farber suggests that heightened interest rates in the U.S. could exacerbate inflationary pressures. Meanwhile, Federal Reserve officials have articulated their position, emphasizing their need for greater confidence in inflation's trajectory towards the central bank's 2% annual target before contemplating a rate reduction. Despite February's inflation rate dropping to 3.2% from its peak of 9.1% in June 2022, according to the Consumer Price Index, there remains hesitancy due to unexpectedly high consumer price hikes in January and February. These increases have introduced uncertainty regarding the Fed's previous projection of a potential 0.75 percentage point rate reduction for 2024, initially driven by signs of inflation moderation. Let's get back to the interview. I have this very interesting chart from Dr. John Hartnett, who is a subscriber to the Endgame Investor. He is a very smart physicist man, and I talked to him a lot, and so does Chris. So he jiggered this chart for me after Argentinian libertarian economist Alan Futterman, who I had an interview with on my channel, informed me that the amount of reserves that are earning interest at the Argentinian Central Bank is three times the entire monetary base of the country. Central bank liabilities that are earning this 100% nominal, nominal rate per year are three times the monetary base. I'll give you a number. I think if I'm not mistaken from what I saw last week, it's about 30 trillion pesos. And so what the central bank is doing is trying to sterilize all the money it's printing by paying interest. And that interest goes out into the economy, into the monetary system anyway, which makes prices higher and there's nothing they can do to stop it. So this is the point where higher interest rates actually feed into higher inflation, which is, I think, the point that we are getting to in the United States as well. So here you see the blue line. This is the amount of reserves earning interest at the Fed. Forget the other line for now. This is the reserves plus the reserve versus repos that are earning interest at the Fed. And this is the percentage of the monetary base. So here we had a maximum here of about 110% of the monetary base earning reserves at the Fed. In Argentina, it's 300%. It's going down now because the reverse repos are declining, but during the next printing round, this number is gonna go way up. And we saw during the 2020 printing round, it went from about 60, 58%, something like that, to 110%. So this time it will probably go up to something like 200%, maybe more. And if it really gets out of control, it'll go to 300% and we'll be in the same place as Argentina, at least in terms of the amount of liabilities earning interest at the central bank. Gold futures is now up about 140,000 contracts. So this chart here is from Gold Charts R Us, and it shows here the open interest. I drew a line where we are now at about 541,000 or 539,000, somewhere around there. Uh, so we draw a line here and it brings us all the way back to the last time we were at this number, which was July of 2022. And what was happening at that point? I'm not necessarily saying this is going to happen again right now, but there is always a potential for a short squeeze. There was a minor one here. And how do you know it was a short squeeze? Because 
open interest was falling in the face of a rising gold price. And what this showed to me is that we were very near the bottom over here, which was around 1700. And the bottom happened to be at 1618 or 1610, about two months later. So close to the bottom, not quite the bottom, but it did signal that the bottom was close. So this is a short squeeze because here you see the green lines, are they green? The green lines were falling from about 540,000 in open interest to about 450,000. And as those contracts were closing, the price was rising. This wasn't a crazy short squeeze like we're seeing in chocolate right now or cocoa. We're seeing a major short squeeze in cocoa. Uh, that's probably also because of physical reasons. There is a shortage of cocoa and people want chocolate because they're depressed and they, uh, you know, they want more chocolate. I understand that. I don't know anything about chocolate markets, but uh, you know, I want to try those fruits and uh, have some actual chocolate fruit. What do they call those things? They look yummy. I never had one. So anyway, at this point, if we have another short squeeze at all-time highs, it would be very different than a short squeeze like this, which came from 1700 and didn't get us that far. But uh, the higher open interest goes here, the bigger potential we have for a short squeeze, though we're not in one yet. If the banks start covering and price starts rising, that's what we will be in. We'll see in the weeks and months ahead. With the Federal Reserve implementing rate cuts and quantitative easing to stabilize an ailing economy following previous rate hikes, the gold-silver ratio surged to nearly 93 to 1. However, as both gold and silver experienced a rally, the ratio dropped sharply from over 100 to 1 to just above 64 to 1, approaching the upper limit of its historical range. Marcus Garvey, Macquarie's head of commodity strategy, sees the expectation of rate cuts as propelling gold and silver, describing it as risk positive for both precious metals. How could the Federal Reserve's cautious stance on rate cuts affect inflation and the prospects for gold and silver? Share your thoughts in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.